So yesterday you identified the different types of breaks within your manuscript. Some of those might have been chapter breaks, section breaks, even just page breaks. You might have also figured out where you had some subsection breaks. You might have found areas where you needed a transitional word, phrase, or sentence. And then you were stuck with all of these areas where there's a break, but they need to be connected. That was where our seven transitional scenes were meant to come into play. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about these today, and I'm not gonna be writing a whole lot on the board because the easiest way for me to show you these is to actually break them down into their different examples. So as you're watching this video here today, you're going to see some examples dropped in throughout, and you're going to learn how to apply these different transitions to your own story scripts. So transitions are the things that you are going to use to sew together those different elements of your script. From the very beginning, you were working on your storyboard or your roadmap, and you rearranged it, and then we worked on bulking each of those pieces and stylizing each of those pieces over the last few weeks. Now you have all of these great written pieces. Some of them have been developed with research. Others have been developed through brainstorm. You've applied different sensory writing methods to them and brainstorm methods and all of these great things. And now you have these many well-written but disconnected pieces. Our transitions are unique because instead of just using that word or that phrase that's going to move forward time or distance, transitions actually connect in such a way that they also enrich the story. So you want to use transitions as much as you can. We have seven different types of transitions and you want to mix them up within your writing. The first of those transitions is backstory. Backstory is when you are going to make a logical connection between why a character wants to move from one moment to another. You're going to give a history that, are go that is going to outline a natural motive. We're going to use in this, we are going to use a very simple two-part scene. Sam got an A on her paper, and we're also going to use Bill's house was unlocked, so she let herself in as she had done for the last 10 years. So we have this Sam got an A on her paper, she went to tell Bill, and we have Sam arriving at Bill's house and unlocking it and letting herself in. Totally connected scenes already. You don't necessarily have to do anything, but if you want to enrich the story, what if you build out that time between deciding to tell Bill and actually entering Bill's house? First, we're gonna start with backstory. Sam got an A on her paper. She went to tell Bill. Our backstory? How could she want to tell anybody else when she and Bill had been best friends since they were only six years old and they met on the playground equipment at school? Bill's house was unlocked, so she let herself in as she had done for the last 10 years. Here we've added a backstory. We know they've known each other since they were six years old. We know that they're kind of old pals. They didn't necessarily have a romantic interest going on here. That's a little bit of a backstory for them. The next thing that you have is character thoughts, and you're going to find that these next two are very similar. Character thoughts are very tangible things that are going on in your character's mind. It's going to fill in the time between the two story elements by disappearing into the active thoughts of the character's mind. Sam got an A on her paper. She went to tell Bill. Sam's thoughts. Would Bill be happy for her? Would, be, would he be jealous because the same paper had proven so difficult for him? Sam wasn't certain, but she had to find out. Bill's house was unlocked, so she let herself in as she had done for the last 10 years. These are active thoughts. They're very tangible, they're very logical, they're things that actually happened and are actually being thought about. The difference between character thoughts and our next transition, character imagination, is that character imagination is not tangible, it's not always logical. Sometimes it's going to be something a little bit different than that thought piece. So it's similar, but you're going to, in, instead of the factual thoughts, you're going to have the hopes, the dreams, the fears, all of those things are going to be what's going on in your character's mind. Sam got an A on her paper. She went to tell, she went to tell her friend Bill. She could picture it now. 
Her best friend would pick her up, so proud of her accomplishment, in a giant bear head hug. The two would be spinning around and around in gleeful celebration. In anticipation of the expected congratulations to come, Sam let herself into Bill's unlocked house as she had done for the last 10 years. We've connected this through hopes and dreams here. It could just as easily be connected through something very negative. The next one is one of my favorites. I use it very often. This is called Preparation Montage. Now, some of you have seen those Disney after school movies that all of our kids grew up with, or some of us may have grown up with them. And the montage was perfected by these types of movies and by movies in the 80s, mind you. This is when there's one song and they buy a house that's totally destroyed, it should be condemned, and through the course of a song, you see them having fun with paint and with scrub brushes and with hammers and nails. And by the end of the song, they have created this beautiful, perfect setting for whatever goal it is that they need to accomplish. That is the birth of the montage. Now, how can we make such a tool work for our own writing? And that is what preparation montage is all about. Preparation montage, rather than going into the character's mind, the real actions of the character are noted. You kind of are gonna go through a checklist of things that need to occur between those two settings that you've created. So scene one, Sam got an A on her paper. She wanted nothing more than to tell Bill. Let's build in our preparation montage. Sam folded the paper in half, tucked it into an envelope. She sealed it carefully inside by moistening the glue. The taste didn't even bother, as it usually does. After retouching her lipstick, she kissed the bottom of the triangular envelope seal and wrote S-W-A-K, sealed with a kiss under the red smudged heart shape of her lips. A small spritz of her favorite perfume and Bill's too would make the package perfect for her delivery. She couldn't wait to place the achievement into his hands. Bill's house was unlocked, so she let herself in as she had done for the last 10 years. Now, if you ask me, Sam is taking this A on her paper a little too seriously, but we put that together so that you could kind of see how a preparation montage works. Preparation montage has a brother just like character thought has the brother of character imagination. The brother of preparation montage is description. It's relying more on the setting and the objects around the character, but it is still going to walk through a step-by-step -step transition between scene A and scene B. So Sam got an A on her paper. She went to tell Bill. This is where we're going to move into our description. As Sam walked out of the school, she could already feel the shift in the wind. Fall breezes were turning to winter chills. She kept her head down to avoid the sting of cold against her cheek, and she walked the familiar road to Bill's. As her steps fell against the ground, she watched it change beneath her beaten sneakers from the perfectly squared sidewalk to the cracked asphalt blacktop to, at last, the leaf-cluttered forest path that would lead up to Bill's front door. Bill's house was unlocked, so she let herself in as she had done for the last 10 years. Description. Now, relational dialogue is another way that you can connect your scenes. This is our sixth of seven ways to connect our scenes. The big clue here is that this is a relational dialogue. The point of our transitions is to enrich the story through the connections. By this, I mean that you are not going to just add in more clutter. This is not a chance to go down a rabbit hole. So if you have a dialogue occurring to connect scenes and you want it to actually enrich the story, which is the point of transitions, you are actually going to make that dialogue between people who have actual relationships. It can't be your character passing the mailman and sharing a hello, unless that mailman somehow plays into the story. So a relational dialogue is going to connect the two scenes between a conversation that takes place between related or characters who have a type of relationship. Sam got her, an A on her paper. She couldn't wait to tell Bill. Mom, asked Sam, can I run over to Bill's this afternoon? What for? Questioned Sam's mom suspiciously. I have something I have to show him, Sam begs impatiently. She knows her mother could never understand. With a sigh, I will come looking for you if you don't return in half an hour, she obliged her daughter. Sam was already out the door before her controlling mother could say any other, add any other stipulation. 
The disapproving voice of her mother was still echoing in Sam's ears when she arrived. Bill's house was unlocked, so she let herself in, as she had done for the last 10 years. Now, there's a brother to relational dialogue, just like there's a brother to character imagination and character thoughts, and there's a brother relationship between preparation montage and description. The brother to relational dialogue is argument. Now, unlike all of the other transitions, which actually smooth the flow between scenes, argument does exactly the opposite. It can end up in the air, it can build the tension, it can really leave your reader desiring a resolution to whatever that conflict is. Now, the conflict can be physical. You want to draw out and write out the great, ex exciting fight scene? Totally cool. That actually will work as a transition for an argument. We're going to focus this time on an argument that is verbal, and that's how it becomes the brother of relational dialogue. Sam got an A on her paper. She knew she would have to tell Bill right away. Sam looked up at her teacher, who had teased her all year, called her stupid even. She glared, feeling proud. Are you looking for congratulations, sniped Mrs. Nashy? You really are Mrs. Nasty, aren't you? Sam tearfully shouted back. Why was it so hard to earn that woman's praise? Listen, Sam, I have no intention of calling this a job well done when your classmates were able to get their grades without having to retake a test a second time. Her words cut deep. Sam wanted to say something more, but Mrs. Nasty was right. Sam would never be able to pass the class. After slamming the classroom door behind her, she ran the entire way to her friend's house. Bill's house was unlocked, so she let herself in as she had done for the last 10 years. And that is argument. Now here's the thing about each of these transitions. They all build something within the story. And when you look at your actual handouts that go with this lesson, you're going to see which ones you should best use if you want to build backstory, if you want to build relationships and camaraderie, which ones you want to use if you want to have tension, if you want to have anticipation. Each of these different transitions not only is going to enrich your story, but it is going to enrich the mood that you are desiring to build within your story. So make sure that you look at your forms really closely and use them to decide all those breaks that you identified yesterday, which ones are best to use different transitions for. Once again, you want to have a lot of variety in your transitions and you want to connect each of these in such a way, each of these scenes in such a way as to enrich the story in that passage of time. So good luck with your transitions as you continue to work on your book. Now.